As I mentioned, it's hard to make money in these uh, volatile times. 2011, I would say it has been a very difficult year for fund managers. How have you managed to scrape in 7% gains? I think the key issue is trying to eliminate the risk you don't understand. And uh, so for us, one of the key ingredients was uh, earlier this year to get out of all the currency bets. Uh, and increasing in return precious metal holdings in the portfolio. And the second thing is concentrating on need based investments and playing de risking stories where at least the contribution from the corporate uh -huh. made up for the volatility and uh, the lowering of PEs on general assets in general. Okay, I'll get to that, the second part, in a bit. But you just say you've gotten rid of all your currency holdings. Uh, I think back in 2005 or something like that, 2006? We eliminated the fixed income investments in 2005. and about 2007, we switched out. Uh, we've taken money out uh, to Euro, to Euro mm -hmm. the Swiss franc. Uh, I think we had some Aussie dollar at the time still. Yeah. We reduced that too. And so we shifted that more and more in favor of... What did you market. see coming uh, down the pipeline that you said, well, FX isn't for us anymore. We're going to get into physical assets and gold, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, basically, your yield spread became meaningless. Uh, government interventions in news flow uh, became pretty much apparent. Monetization means that you have a fixing of uh, currencies and interest rates, mm -hmm. so the free market is gone. And if your free market doesn't dictate price, then you, as a fund manager, are always basically at somebody else's back, back and call. Well, so that's what's happening in the currency markets once again. You know, Indonesia's central bank stepped in. You know, traders thought that uh, Korea's central bank and also India's central bank stepped in. And then, of course, you know, the Swiss franc, your home country, we know what happened there with the central bank. And then there's always talk of uh, Japan. You're right. Uh, some are saying it's, the, we, right now we're seeing currencies that are regulated by governments and not by the free markets. I think that will even accelerate. I think uh, if you see the pressures we have today in, in the U.S. and Europe in the banking system, uh, bailing out of even the governments right now means that the intervention is going to increase. It means as well that the next steps will be probably trade protections, trade wars, taxes. And uh, I think as a result, uh, people on the ground will probably start revolting, so we're going to get social unrest, wow. I think, by next year. Okay, well, that doesn't paint a very uh, happy picture, does it? Uh, okay, so what does that mean for the global economy in the next few years? You know, the global economy will probably still grow in nominal terms, uh -huh. because all this money printing is probably going to keep the things up. Right. So if you look at the Dow, you know, it's gone sideways for a long, long time, but yeah. in a purchasing power basis point of view, probably are 30% down. Yes. So I think governments will try to extend that life for as long as they can, and that means, you know, the markets might not totally correct to levels where you say fundamentally I'm become a big buyer. Right. But how do you play now with that environment? So what we are looking at is actually little niches which are not affected by this mass manipulation. Before I went to break, I was saying that you sounded bearish, but you said you actually don't have any shorts on. You're, you're mostly net long right now. I mean, basically, we are an asset protection investor, which means we've got no lending borrowing agreement. We have no shorts. We own all the assets we have. Mm -hmm. And so basically, we are long. We are fully invested. We don't have much cash lying around. Mm -hmm. So the issue is where do you find the opportunities to make money? Mm -hmm. And in an environment where you pump money, your needs have to be continue to be fulfilled every day. Uh -huh. So what do you need for your needs? And I think in today's case, we're looking at food, we're looking at energy, uh, we're looking at tiny little niche products in the met metals industry, which are required to keep our economy going. Uh -huh. And that's where we still find fantastic opportunity. Where do you find those opportunities? We find the opportunities in areas where the supply side is actually falling off over the next two or three years. So if you look at tin market, we think that the supply side will drop about 20%. Uh, if you look at lithium, battery-driven environment, where the high-end lithium production is actually minimal and the demand is going through the roof. Mm -hmm. We look at things like rare earths, where basically the rest of the world has very little rare earths and China right. controls the whole issue. Mm -hmm. uh, we look at silver, which is needed for solar panels and all sorts of other things, uh, new technology, new flat panel screens, where the silver market is in an incredible deficit. Mm -hmm. We like gold of because course. Washington agreement allowed the Western Central Banks to sell 500 tons mm -hmm. till 1990, 2005. Mm -hmm. 
now we have non-Western central banks f buying 500 tons of gold. So right. it's 1,000 dollars, 1,000 tons swing right. in a market which produces 2,500 tons a year. Right. So you're saying gold prices at these levels uh, is even cheap, <laughs> considering we have expectations of, what, thousands of dollars an ounce in the future? Look, I think from uh, demand supply, what we see is that the switch of 40 percent means we have a put in the market and we get higher prices. Right. The other thing we see that monetization is devaluing money, yes. so therefore assets are still going up. And thirdly, we are thinking that over the next three years, we're going to get a new currency realignment globally to mm -hmm. stabilize the world economy. And we believe that we're going to need a gold cover ratio to, as a backing right. to achieve okay. that. Okay, so you, know, you said before that maybe 5,000 in the future could be a possibility, is that right? I think at the moment, you know, uh, the backroom talk is around six thousand dollars to stabilize, stabilize basically the US dollar. I'm not quite sure that it will be sufficient. We're looking actually at five digit numbers. Five digit numbers, ten thousand dollars plus. Yes. Well I mean look, I mean the markets over the past couple of days we get this uplift on some news or headlines that calms people's nerves. For example, yesterday we had a discussion of perhaps the Chinese maybe intervening in the marketplace, we got lift up. But then in the afternoon session we gave a lot of those gains back and went into negative territory. Today, a little bit similar. We bounced up on the strength of Europe and the US and comments from both France and Germany. But in the afternoon session again we seem to drift lower again and you wonder if there's a bit of fatigue from investors coming in the place here well you know what at some point this I, I don't care what the headlines are at this point just I'm gonna stay out of it until things are really settled down because every time the European Union comes in with announcements and steps in it seems to me there's another conflict to report on the other side and that's really confusing a lot of investors on how to position their portfolios. Is there a question in there for well, I mean, my yeah. question is what are you advising your I mean do you have other clients that you're talking to that are experiencing some fatigue from all just the news that's flow uh, that we've seen over the past couple I of think months? In general clients are quite confused what's happening uh, the news flow is massive and as you say, it's contradicting itself, itself every few seconds. So that's one reason why a lot of people sit on the sidelines and think where they want to reposition their portfolios as they go forward. I mean, is, I'm just I'm sorry, the, is the alternative just they sit in cash and you tell that you advise them what to do next, or do they... Well, I think if you look in general and you look, uh, let's say, at the Swiss banking system and maybe a few other systems, you start seeing that the cash pile is actually going up because traditional accounts had quite a lot of fixed income. The fixed income curve is so low, you don't get anything anymore. This money comes to maturity, and if the clients don't know what to do, the cash pile is growing. Unfortunately, this cash pile is not earning anything anymore. So all these people know they want to redispose that money in times to come, but probably in order to do that, they would like to see certain stability where they can say, okay, we are happy to see something's been fixed, and uh, that's how they go forward. Some people who've got large reserves, they start trickling money into specialty fields where they think uh, the returns are still reasonable, uh, well protected, and they've got potential for growth. So we see a bit of both, but the masses of the money is sitting on the sideline and watches. We spent a lot of time this morning talking about this, uh, these ironic moves in the market, the fact that the fundamentals still look very bleak, yet you have Angela Merkel and Nicolas Sarkozy saying, we're still convinced that Greece will remain in the Eurozone. It seems investors latch on to whatever piece of good news they can uh, uh, see. I think very much so. I think people spending too much time on geopolitics and what's a political solution, solution to fix certain problems. And I think uh, what I'm trying to advise my clients is, you know, forget about the things you can't fix, the things which are fundamentally outside your control, and start concentrating on the areas where you have a control. And if you look at a smaller mid-cap sector universe, you see certain areas where you see price explosions on cash flow happening. And so, you know, maybe you don't get the re-rating from a P side straight away, but you see that the companies are getting stronger, the cash flow comes in, they're growing, and to become a stronger company. And so that means you've got to start moving away from a short-term investment where you've got to make money by tomorrow morning, 8 o'clock, and thinking, where's this company going to be in three or four or five years' time? But, but is it a double-edged sword as well? Because no one's going to put money in the market if you can't leave for two minutes in the elevator without worrying that it's dropped 5%. I mean, there's a sense of stability that has to be in place before people feel comfortable investing in the long run. Isn't that true? Well, let's put it that way. If you find an investment which has a payback structure of your capital of, let's say, three years, are you worried about 30% volatility? 
when your risk return factor is somewhere like three up for 30 percent down, wow, it's a fantastic risk return structure. So the question I have then to all the people is, what's your holding power? Why do you buy a house which you live in for tomorrow morning to see that you can resell it? Mm -hmm. Or is it the house you're living in for longer term and maybe for generations and you really want to buy the value? So for a value investor, I think uh, these markets offer fantastic opportunities. Yeah, if you were, had a client that says, I want to take some risk here, where would you go to take some good risk in this market? Look, uh, to start with, we always start with risk-free. Right. And risk-free for us right now is anything which is not controlled by governments, mm -hmm. and for us it's precious metal. So we tell everybody a third of their equity position should be in precious metals. Gold. Gold. Is Maybe gold a bit of silver. So that's for us, you know, the foundation of the house. Mm -hmm. Let me look how we're building the house. And we're starting to look where do we see sectors or subsectors which have great demand supply imbalances. And it hasn't always got to be gross demand. Everybody else looks rest the demand. So we start to look on the supply side. Where do we see supply contraction? So the gap is still going up too. And then we start to look at companies. How many companies in this sector where supply is collapsing? And you start seeing, oh, there are only two companies which have new production growth. So you get growth in an environment where supply goes out. So you've got price protection. Mm -hmm. You've got the structure which is moving up. And in general, you've got great valuations. OK, so let's talk about allocation of your portfolio. You said third goes into metals. Is that right? A third of the equity per position. So okay. if you have 90% equity, then you basically have maybe 25% in physical gold, which leaves you on the end for equities maybe about 70%. Oh. Gold is a quarter. Look for our global balanced or global macro portfolio, it's a third. Uh, for our energy mining fund, it's 10% because we take the risk through the equity part. Mm. Oh, that's interesting. So the equity, not the physical metal. Then. Now, the main reason we are boosting the, the mining shares exposure is the following. If you look, uh, gold in 2007 was about half the price of where we are today. Uh -huh. right? So we have a doubling of the price of the underlying, but the mines are still trading at the same level in 2007. They've done all the capex. Mm -hmm. They bring the production on stream. The capex is going down. Okay. The cash flow out of this production is coming in. So you see cash flow increasing dramatically, okay. which means the company can either do M&A, share buyback, or even increases. Okay. So how many sectors or companies do you see which have that kind of criteria. Right. So if you trade at 10 times PE and you have something like that, I think over the next three years you start making money. Okay. The other issue is if you look at Wall Street banks, their forward prediction where this metal price is going to be in five years for gold is $1,100. Yeah. $1,100? Are you kidding me? I just can't see that happening. So let's say these investment bankers are moving up this curve to maybe $1,400, $1,500 means your NPV valuations is going up, your clients are buying, your shares are going up. 